Hello, I'm Anthony. Today I want to talk about extended or programmable USB keyboards. I have uh, an Expert Keys EK84 programmable keyboard, which I've discovered this week may no longer be on sale. I'm not sure where Expert Keys have gone, but you can't buy this anymore. But if you search for programmable USB keyboards, you'd find many equivalents of this kind of thing. I'm pointing at it, but you can't see my hand. It's, it's over here. Um, and it's an absolutely essential part of my workflow. What I want to do today is go through how I've configured this thing and very similar to a video I made last week about the standard PC keyboard, I really want to talk about this magic word heuristics, basic principles that we can extract to guide us in our decisions because you're not going to want to configure your system exactly how I have set up mine, but if I show you some of the principles that I've used in configuration, hopefully that'll help you. Uh, if you want to download a copy of this uh, a keyboard shortcut file as well, um, together with all of my uh, presets for keyboard shortcuts, uh, patrons and YouTube channel members can download those. Check out the links below if that's something that interests you. So what I've decided to do today is to go through this extended keyboard section by section. As you can see, I've got it color coded. All of these colors have some sort of meaning to me, but that's just because of the way my brain works. Once again, I'll show you what those principles are and then you can kind of extract them out uh, as you require. And I'm not gonna talk about every single function on this thing today, I think that would be redundant, but I am gonna refer quite heavily back to this um, document where I've basically labeled out all of the functions in my system, anything noted EK84. Um, I've basically made a note of where in the, uh, in the edit, in the key commands, um, section you'll be able to find these things and also my particular keyboard shortcut which shouldn't be interesting to anybody because they're entirely bespoke. So without further ado let's make a start. Top left hand corner the yellow section this is incredibly simple. These are where I have my markers configured. Now I do also have keyboard shortcuts set out for these. The numeric keypad numbers three to nine are the same uh, have the same functionality as these buttons. And depending on whether or not I'm using my mouse with my right hand, so I want to use the extended keyboard with my left, or whatever's going on, I'll use one or the both. But it's really nice to have that array of both set and recall. So just as a matter of, you know, it's completely obvious, I'm going to press set five. And there you can just see, for some reason, a couple of updates ago, Cubase stopped putting automatic descriptions in their set markers, and it absolutely drives me crazy. So if I now move the cursor to a new place and say, recall marker five, then the cursor will jump there. I actually use marker three is always the beginning of my song. So if I press recall marker three, you can see always, always jumps to the beginning of my song, which is actually before any audio. I always have this little gap. So if I wanna hear the entire thing back, I'll recall marker three, press play, and it's gonna be that amount of time before the song starts. Set marker nine to the end of the song, although I haven't in this case, but that's another very common kind of thing that I do typically. Other than that, not much more interesting to be said about markers, let's move on. The green section down the left-hand side is all the zoom functions. Now, this is a, this is a physical thing. This is a, these are here for a reason, because my hand moves down the left-hand side of the, of the device, and I use these functions so often that I've basically got two fingers that track down these buttons and I know exactly where they all are. Zoom locators is probably the most commonly used of all of the functions. If I press zoom locators, that's just, I use that so often. And you've obviously got different splits in the two windows to give you those two different views. Zoom full is also fabulous. Press zoom full and now I can see my entire song. Zoom in and out vertically is only used uh, when you're actually editing audio. Let's jump into some audio. And if I activate vary audio on this track, you'll see that I can, there we go. I'm zooming in and zooming out vertically. Now those keyboard shortcuts are configurable in the commands. Let's go back to our Excel file. So these functions zoom in vertically and zoom out vertically are the ones you want. And as you can see, I've got keyboard shortcuts set up for them, but they're in the zoom section of your preferences file. And then the four different levels of zoom, zoom one, zoom two, zoom three, and zoom four. There are more than that, there's loads more. Here they all are. I don't bother with any of these. I'm only interested in the top four, uh, which are configurable once again from inside your preferences. Zoom two is probably my go-to. That's how I like my project to look. It names 
all of the events and parts and I can see everything nice and simply. But if I really want to see that holistic view of the entire song, very often my entire song will fit in zoom one. So they're super common. Three and four are generally used if I'm processing audio and I want to see bigger waveforms. So really ergonomically convenient. That's this nice cluster of the many, many zoom functions available to you. Choose which ones you want to really concentrate in on. Of course, I also use the, I'm pressing the control key down on my P, uh, on my keyboard and then uh, mouse wheel up and down on the mouse is something, again, I do very, very commonly. It focuses, if I uh, hover over 79, you know, it zooms right in on 79. So that's a great thing to do as well. Undo and redo at the bottom left-hand corner. Once again, super tactile. I know that they're at the bottom left-hand corner of my machine. That's them sorted. We've got five select functions. There are so many different ways to select data in Cubase. I used to have 20 buttons configured for select and it was too many, I couldn't remember them all. So I ended up just selecting the ones that I most wanted to extract. And another really huge golden principle, don't assign a button to your programmable keyboard if it's not used commonly because it's just mental clutter. You'll just forget stuff that you actually want to remember. Oh, by the way, since last time, tilde and the at symbol, um, shift tilde and shift at symbol are now baked in. There's my transpose plus and minus one octave. I've taught myself how to do that after last episode. Anyway, these five uh, select functions, they're fairly self-explanatory and it doesn't actually matter what they do. Once again, that's completely bespoke to me. I'm not going to bore you with that level of detail. Just suffice to say that they're really, again, conveniently labeled. I had five functions and a certain number of buttons on the programmable keyboard left to assign after I'd done all the, the, the really important stuff, the stuff that I most wanted, which are down the left and right hand sides for tactile purposes. Some of this stuff down the middle, particularly this select column, I don't use them all the time. Select all, same octave is probably the most common function I use. Um, and that is select equal pitch, same octave. In the, uh, in the edit command, really great command that. So if you wanna delete like all of your snares from a drum line, you select one, press that button, and you've selected every snare hit, and then you can do whatever you want with them, mute them, delete them, whatever. Similarly with the column of delete commands, some of these are actually macros or logical edit functions, which we'll discuss in a later episode. I'm gonna show you under the hood of how I use logical editing and macro, which is a pretty light touch. I don't use many commands from, from that functionality, but it is important to understand how it works. And I do use it. And some of the features in there are really fabulous. Uh, delete tiny notes is a great one. Delete loose doubles again. These are functions that I've written. I've got baked in to, the, to Cubase and you can configure macros and logical edit processes to be assignable to keyboard shortcuts. And that's what I've done there. Now this central range of pink buttons is the least visually satisfactory, but at least it does make some sense to me. They're actually functionally clustered in a horizontal layer. I could have made five different colors, but it just got too gaudy, too many colors. But basically these are functions that, are, that have some link or a sense of commonality between them on a horizontal basis. But other than that, absolutely nothing. There's nothing duplicate track bears no resemblance whatsoever to what merge unmuted, which is the button above. It's the rows that are important, but they are all used and in constant review. For instance, split range, I don't think I've ever used that button. So I might very well be looking to get rid of that at some point and see if there's something more useful that I can put in there. The other two, brilliant, I use them loads. Duplicate no data is just absolutely awesome and I use that masses. And that because I know that I'm, I'm so fond of that function and I use it so much, it's on the bottom row because the bottom row is the most, you know, it's one of those tactile areas that it's easiest to reach without looking at it. So duplicate no data, basically just, uh, if I've got this track here and press the button, it does exactly that, it gives me a copy of the track, but hasn't copied any of the automation or the event data across just the track itself. Annoyingly, I can't make it record arm simultaneously. I could probably find some way to put that into a macro at some point. I might, uh, might make a note to, to look at that at some point in the future. Just as a quick reminder, every one of these functions in the document, if you need to screenshot it, if you don't want to download this thing, then you can find out you know, where each of these things are. So here's render settings. I'll search for render. 
I'm going to find, there we are, two render settings and render with current settings. Those are the two buttons that correspond, the two functions that correspond to these buttons. So you'll always see keyboard shortcuts because that's how you map your programmable keyboard to them. These tools um, don't have anything typed because they're just the numeric keys. The eight buttons on the right hand side have jumped over the blue bits. Um, they're simply the numeric numbers. So if I press number four on my PC keyboard, then it's going to turn me, it's going to turn my cursor into an eraser. So these functions in the toolbar, they all have um, by default uh, numeric uh, values assigned to them. I just prefer to have them. I can never remember what the numbers are. So I use these buttons arranged in order of precedence. Delete and comp are the most functional and they're kind of intellectually linked. Uh, one of them is selecting you know, individual sections of a lane to audition. Delete is getting rid of it if, you, if you're done with it. If you're processing lanes, those are the two functions you're using the most. Split and glue, again, functionally related. The four above don't get used quite so much, but you know they are all there on those shortcut keys for me to select. At the top right-hand corner of this thing, we've got six mute functions of a vast array of different mute functions that are spread across the system. So let's see where all, all our mute commands live. There's a macro. There's one in process. That's a, a logical editor function. There's one in the edit command. So they're all over the place, they're spread across the system, but they all serve the same purpose. They're all about muting or soloing tracks. So I've collected all of that functionality together and now it makes much more sense to me. I'll give you an example of how this stuff works. So I can select those events and then I can say mute them. So that's then muted. Let's undo that. I can have those events selected and say mute everything else. I want to keep these. That's that done. Let's undo that. If I've previously muted those and I changed my mind, I can unmute selected. That's that done. If I'm listening to the project and I've got multiple different tracks muted and I want to throw all of my mute states away, uh, deactivate mute does that. Similarly with solo, quite regularly you'll have multiple tracks soloed uh, and you want to get rid of all of that and just listen to the entire thing. Bosh, that's that done. And solo defeat is really cool. It basically takes tracks out of the solo chain, It'll turn it orange. So now anything that gets soloed will ignore the previously defeated tracks. In other words, they're kind of protected from the from the solo mechanism and they'll always be left alone and you'll be able to hear them and so a defeat is a toggle button and i can toggle that state on and off easily enough there's nothing much interesting to say about these blue buttons they're basically pairs they're functional pairs similarly to the the pink rows were, that were functionally linked uh, triplets of buttons apart from that really unsatisfying pair at the top. Can you see, I've, I've been kind of trying to lay this thing out as logically as possible, but it got to the stage where I had six pairs of functions that needed to be added somewhere. And this was my solution. It's the best I could do. But ideally, um, insert range and cut range should kind of be blue. Yes, it does keep me awake at night, but you know, I'm trying to move on. The most important thing is that I've memorized all of these buttons primarily through use. You have to make yourself, I'll have like random days where I'll say, right, I'm going to train myself where the legato button is. And every time I'm performing an, an action, I'll just arbitrarily perform a legato uh, function on the, on the MIDI part, which is basically where you kind of join, join notes together. So there's no gaps in between them. I'll do that pointlessly just to train myself where that button lives every now and again, if you kind of flow over your, your programmable keyboard, and teach yourself all of the buttons that you've programmed. When you come to use them, you will remember where they are. It's a little bit of overhead for a fantastic time saving when you actually want that functionality at your fingertips. So you might not be able to get the EK84 anymore, but there are plenty of alternatives on the market. You can get over a hundred keys. I actually don't want anything bigger than this. That This is perfect for me from the sense of how much real estate it takes on my table. You can see that I have buttons unconfigured that's not for any aesthetic purpose. There's just nothing that I wanted to put in there that wasn't going to be mental clutter if I did. These functions in the spreadsheet are asterisked because they're currently candidates for this row of uh, five unassigned buttons. I'm considering 
using them for track and channel channel and track visibility features. I haven't made my mind up yet, but that's again part of this ongoing evolving process where I'm trying to keep this thing as efficient and lean as possible. I hope some of that's been useful to you. If it was, please hit like. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.